Welcome to Weld.com. My name is Adam Stretch. I'm the program coordinator and one of the welding instructors here at Pellissippi State Community College. I'm also one of the advisors here with Weld.com and a certified welding inspector. A lot of you have been requesting some more information on becoming a certified welder, what that looks like, what it means, and what it takes. Before we get started talking about certifications, we have to understand what we're certifying to. What is, what is certification? What does that mean? So from a welder's perspective, that's, that's more of a qualification. You've actually taken a qualification test. You followed a welding procedure that was developed using a, a PQR or pre-qualified weld procedure. Somebody gave you a WPS, a, a welding procedure specification. You followed what that WPS was telling you to do. You've completed a weld. It was inspected by an inspector. They did non-destructive and then usually destructive testing afterwards. Upon completion of the destructive testing, it was discovered that your welds were acceptable. They met the acceptance criteria of one of these codes, at which point a welder qualification record was completed. So now that is your certification. You've become a certified welder. There's a lot more to understanding this, and that's what we're going to take a look at here. So you start with the code book. You want to become certified. Certified to what? What code are we talking about? Is it AWS D1.1, the structural steel welding code? Well, this doesn't apply if we're welding on aluminum. Is it the American Petroleum Institute API 1104 code? Well, that doesn't apply if we're welding on structural steel. What about D1.2, the aluminum code? Are we welding on steel? We're welding on steel, I can't be certified on aluminum. 1.6, stainless steel? Doesn't do me any good if I'm welding aluminum. If I'm welding aluminum, the stainless steel doesn't do me any good. B2.1, the catch-all for everything that's left. And this is just some of the American Welding Society's codes. API is the American Petroleum Institute. The ASME, or American Society of Mechanical Engineers, Section 8, Section 9, 31.1, 31.3, are, are fairly common codes. Up north, A, we've got the Canadian Welding Bureau. They've got their own set of codes to follow. If anybody's doing nuclear work, you've got the NRC, Nuclear Regula Regulatory Committee. You've got international codes. Every country or things like the European Union have different codes that they're following. So when you talk about being certified, we have to make sure that we are certifying to the material and the process that we're going to be using. A lot of them don't overlap. We also have to determine whether that procedure is going to have some essential variables that we are going to step beyond and if we cross a threshold say we increase wire diameter or increase change electrodes we might have to recertify so you you can easily see if you're changing things how somebody could need two or three or four or 75 or 80 certs as a certified welder and that's just for one company to encompass all of the different things you might come across in your welding career we want to start with, with throttling this back, though. This is a lot of information. This is all stuff you get into as a certified welding inspector, being able to decipher each one of these codes and, and applications. So we're going to throttle that back. For this series of videos, we're going to be starting with the AWS, American Welding Society, D1.1 Structural Steel Welding Code, just to help us narrow down our perspective. So let's take a look at what the inspector is looking for. What, what is this procedures and WPSs and PQRs and, and WQTRs? What is all this stuff? Let's take a look. So as we talk about being a certified welder, let's talk about what the inspector is gonna have and what they're gonna be looking for. The things maybe you should bring with you to a weld test or have with you as you're taking a weld test so that you can check your own parts prior to the inspector coming to take a look. So the inspector is gonna show up, right? They might have a nice little weld inspection kit. 
with some fancy gauges they're going to do. What is this stuff? And what are you doing with it? The two primary ones that you're going to need as a welder would be a set of fillet weld gauges and some kind of a, a VWAC or a way to measure undercut and excessive reinforcement. So these are to check the size of the fillet weld. This would be used to check undercut and reinforcement on your, on your groove welds or undercut on a, on a fillet weld. The other things that you would want to take with you, a flashlight, some way to illuminate the area, make sure you're looking at the right stuff, a level, you know, just a little torpedo level of some sort, a six inch scale, it's used very often. Something to write with, soapstone, um, silver streaks, pencils, scribes, six inch combination square, sharpies, markers, I don't know, tape measure, speed square. I mean, these are all tools that are just gonna make it a little bit easier for you, but really you're going to need Something to write with, something to, to highlight or to mark. A lot of environments aren't as bright as you'd like them to be, so carrying a, a flashlight of some sort with you, always a good idea. We're going to take a look at how these tools are used in the inspection process, both from you as the welder prior to the inspector coming to take a look at it and some of the things the inspector is going to be looking for. If you can catch it before they come to look at it, you still own it. It's still your weld. You've got plenty of time to fix it. Make it right prior to sending it to the inspector. Once it goes to them, they look at it and it becomes a pass fail, acceptable or reject. You can make it right before it gets to that inspector. It also helps you make sure the parts that you're turning out, once you've gotten that certification, are meeting that procedure or that blueprint that you're working from. If it's got call outs for weld symbols, for say a, a half inch fillet weld, you can make sure that you are providing that half inch fillet weld before you send it away and it needs to be reworked afterwards. So let's make sure that you're comfortable with these tools and we'll see what each one does. One thing that we have to keep in mind is you as the certified welder is who does the certification actually belong to? So something that comes into play is the welding procedure is typically owned by a company. You as the owner of a company or the accredited test facility, American Welding Society, something along that line. So let's kind of break those down a little bit. So the most common way that somebody's going to become a certified welder would be a certified welder, you'd be following a procedure that's owned by a company. You would hire in with company XYZ. You would take their certification test. That certification test would be based on their procedure qualification using their materials on their equipment that they have determined meets all acceptance criteria for its application. You would take that qualification test, would qualify you in whatever positions or material or process that you had been tested to. You as the welder are certified, but you're certified to a procedure that's owned by that company. That procedure or that certification does not go with you if you leave. If you go work for somebody else or if you're doing work on the side and somebody says, hey, are you certified? And you're like, yeah, I'm a certified welder. Well, are you? Do you own that certification? or does that actually belong to somebody else? So we've got to make sure we establish kind of the acceptance criteria we're using here when we talk about the certification itself. Another application would be you as the company or sole proprietorship or business owner have determined that you would like to have a certification, an in-house certification. Now you may have as a welder underneath your own company, get those certifications and they would be tied to your company then. That, that welding procedure would be tied to your company. The advantage to that is if you brought in somebody else, another employee, they could also be qualified to a procedure that's owned then by
by your company. The last way that the certifications work is if you went to an American Welding Society accredited test facility or AWS ATF and took a weld test, you could become a certified welder through the American Welding Society and their ATF program. That certification would belong to you as the welder and it would require a renewal with the American Welding Society approximately every six months. The things that come into play here is how often are you gonna use this process? Is this a one and done? Who needs to own it? Who needs to own that certification? If you are certified through a company and you can get a copy of your certification, that's great. A lot of people ask if you're a certified welder, but they don't entirely understand what that certification entails, who it belongs to, who maintains ownership of it, who was responsible for developing it, and where it goes from there. I hope this helps you out in understanding a little bit more about the certifications.